I will introduce a game for those of you who didn't make it to morning tea. Our seminar speaker today is Alexa Fredston. She's joining us from the US where she is a postdoc at Rutgers Uni um, in Marlon Pinsky's lab. She has a PhD from the Bren School of Environmental Science and Management um, at UC Santa Barbara. Um, and a BA from Princeton in Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. And today she's talking to us about advancing our understanding and prediction of range dynamics in marine species experiencing climate change and how to manage them. So I'll hand over to you, Alexa. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much for the invitation. I'm very excited to be here virtually. I've actually been to UQ a few years ago for a working group meeting that was in person and Loved my visit, love Brisbane, and wish I was there with you in person, but I'll just try to picture it. So let me share my slides and then we'll get started here. How does that look? Oops. Awesome. Okay. Today we're going to talk about understanding, predicting, and managing marine species on the move. The fundamental question I work on is why are species found where they are and not elsewhere? Why would any species have an equatorward range edge on land between the subtropics and the tropics, a region that generally has a pretty continuous climate? What makes juveniles of some whales and sharks aggregate in very specific regions of the oceans while adults of the same species have global distributions? How are biogeographic boundaries maintained on land or in the oceans? This question has a twin which is what makes species move. Species ranges are dynamic, they just move a lot generally. But in the past few decades, it's also become clear that they're moving directionally. Species are on the move across rivers, landscapes, seascapes. Species are shifting their ranges in response to global climate change, upwards in elevation, deeper into the oceans, and in general towards the poles. This global reorganization of biodiversity is one of the biggest effects that we've had on the biosphere and it has profound consequences for nature and for people. Some species might benefit from climate related rain shifts if new habitat opens up that wasn't previously available to them. But many others will be harmed as their historic habitats become too warm and they might struggle to spread into new ones. These species level effects can cascade up to communities and entire ecosystems and this has been documented in many places around the world, including Australia. Climate related rain shifts have big consequences for human welfare and well being. There are many examples of this. Today, we'll talk a lot about how rain shifts are affecting marine resources and fisheries, but there are examples from human disease, from species that are important to indigenous culture, and many, many others. And we won't come back to this in this talk, but in case you're not convinced that species on the move are a problem, some Rain shifts have been substantial enough to actually have feedbacks of the climate itself, like bark beetles in North America that have spread throughout the continent and decimated forests, in turn making them much more prone to fire. I'm not going to spend any more time trying to convince you that species are shifting their ranges because of climate change. But I do want to point out that even though we're very sure that's true, there's a strong correlation between historical temperatures and where species have been found. It's not enough to predict their distributions. Climate alone can't really tell us where species were in the past or where they'll be in the future. Let me give some examples of this because I think it's important to unpack. This top left figure is from a study on North American birds that looked at their distributions in a historical period, 79 to 82, and a recent one, 07 to 10. And this is just for one bird species, but many of them in the study looked this way. I don't actually remember which color is which time period, but it doesn't matter because they had exactly the same distribution. The neither range edge shifted, as you can see here, this is latitude on the x-axis, and neither did the weighted center of the distribution. In the bottom left, we have a survey of, again, North American trees this time, and looking at their changes in distribution over a period of warming. Like the top left figure, we would have expected them to move toward the poles, and if that were the case, you would see the northern boundary increase, which is the top part of this figure, and the southern boundary go um, towards the poles, which is this top left quadrant. But you can see only 20% of the species in the study actually did that, which is about as many as went the opposite direction. These trees marched towards the equator. They're 
equator or boundary extended further and their poleward one retracted. Actually, the most common thing that they found in this study is that ranges just got smaller. Both the equatorward and poleward edges contracted. Here, the dot size is just the seed size, which didn't really help explain that much of um, species patterns. This is going to be mostly a marine talk. So on the right, we have a marine example, which is a species distribution modeling comparison paper. The authors tested different methods of species distribution modeling against historical records of plankton. And their null model was something called a persistence forecast, which is when you say, I have no information about where this species will be found in the future. And so my forecast is just identical to my final year of data. That's where I think the species will be for all time. For one of these species distribution models that was trained on historical climate to beat the persistence forecast, it would be green on this figure. And as you can see, there's not very much green, even though these are marine species that we might expect to be tightly linked to climate. As ecologists though, this shouldn't actually surprise us that much because we know how many processes really matter in determining species ranges in addition to climate. You probably had some of these explanations in mind for the examples in the last slide. So this is really where we'll focus today, understanding what processes really drive range dynamics in the Anthropocene so that we can predict and manage species on the move. That's why I split this talk into understanding, predicting, and managing. I promise it's a pretty short talk, so we have lots of time to discuss later. So I'm just going to give you a snapshot of some of the work I've done on each of these topics. We'll start out looking at temperature tracking at marine range edges, then talk about the work I'm currently doing on short-term forecasting of mid-Atlantic species, and wrap up talking a little bit about management, mostly marine protected area planning. Normally you put the data acknowledgements for your work at the end, but everything I'm about to present to you uses really extraordinary data sets from the United States National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration that I wanna acknowledge up front because they're so unique, so extensive and so pivotal to the work I do. So everything I'm about to talk about would not have been possible without decades of government funding, and workers who went out and conducted biodiversity surveys that have informed a lot of work on global change. My work on global change, looking empirically at this data in the past, has focused on range edges. I study range edges because if you understand what's happening at the range edge, you have a very good sense of what the species is doing in general in response to climate change. Range edges are where colonization and extinction actually happen. So it's sort of the frontier of a biogeographic process. It's also the area that we often get asked about. Managers don't typically come to ecologists and say, when will the centroid of this species move half a degree latitude? They more often come to us with questions like, when will this invasive species turn up in my region? Or when will this high value species leave my region? Those are edge questions. But I was sort of surprised when I started this work to realize that range edges haven't been terribly well studied in the Anthropocene. And there, I think, are a few reasons for that. First of all, they're not defined. Everyone has a sort of bespoke way that they copulate a range edge. They're very hard to measure because you need big data sets, large spatial scales, but collected at a fine enough resolution that you can detect sort of fine scale change and repeated frequently over time to understand dynamics. That's why this NOAA data is so special. And there are also sort of conflicting theories of what edges should do in response to climate change or other ecological processes that we haven't had many field tests of. So I started trying to conduct these types of field tests using marine data. The first two theories that I started with, which are not the only theories of range edges by any means, are the thermal niche hypothesis. You can also think of this as an ecophysiology hypothesis. It proposes that range edges are temperature mediated and as soon as temperature changes, the edge will shift. This is sort of implicitly what is often assumed about marine ectotherms when we fit models to their distributions that suggest that the, realized, the temperatures where they're found, the realized thermal niches are always where they will be found. The other hypothesis that I looked into was from terrestrial biogeography proposing that the Poleward range edge, okay, maybe is mediated by temperature, but the equatorward range edge, which faces less climate variability, but more biodiversity because of the latitudinal biodiversity gradient, that one is mediated by interactions like competition or predation. This is called the species interactions abiotic stress hypothesis. So the first test that we did was looking at 
poleward or cold edges in the oceans versus equatorward or warm edges to see if the poleward edges would track temperature better than the equatorward ones, which would be tentative support for the species interactions abiotic stress hypothesis. We did this in the Northeast United States, one of these regions surveyed by NOAA, using over 50 years of annual data and measuring range edge position along this coastal axis that's outlined here with waypoints labeled. We ended up with 14 poleward edges in this region and 29 equatorward ones. Because marine species have very large ranges, none of these belong to the same species. All of the poleward edges were species that are found in warmer waters, and all of the equatorward edges belong to species that lived in colder waters. And we quantified edges by looking at quantiles of presence and absence, which means we looked at all the points along the coast, along this line where a species had been found. And if it was a poleward edge species, we estimated the edge at the 95th percentile of those points. If it was an equatorward edge, we used the fifth percentile. And that gave us a time series of where the edge was found over this 50 years. Then we compared that to where we would expect to find the range edge if it stayed at a consistent temperature. So in the first few years, um, which you can see here, now the x-axis is time, we estimated the temperature in the part of the coast, wherever it was, where an edge was found. And then we looked up every year where along the coast that temperature would be encountered and thus kind of what the null hypothesis is for where the edge would be if it were perfectly tracking temperature. Those, that's called an isotherm and that's also what's shown on the right in these black lines. Every species had its own edge temperature based on the first few years where it was found. These are some reference ones for round numbers. And as you can see, for all of them, they're trending up the coast towards the poles. And so if an edge were tracking temperature, we would have expected it both to follow these ups and downs and in general to shift poleward. This is some examples of a couple of the edges that we studied. And I wanna make two points here. Both of these shifted significantly poleward over the time series. That's point number one. But the other point is how much noise there is against that signal. We really needed a long time series to detect change in the correct magnitude, but also the correct direction. And it's illustrated here with these dotted lines showing that if we'd taken a resurvey approach, which is a much more common way to study range edges with one historical point and one recent point, like the bird distributions that I showed you earlier, that could have misled us not only about the direction of shift, but also the magnitude because of how stochastic these edges are. So about half of each group, the poleward and equator group shifted north, but the poleward edges both shifted further and tracked temperature better than equatorward edges. That said, very few of them actually had a one-to-one -one relationship with that isotherm over time. So even in these marine ectothermic species, these are fishery target species, it's a bottom trawl survey, so it's mostly fishes like groundfish. Uh, perfect climate tracking was really rare. Because of that, we decided to zoom in on just this one hypothesis and ask, how well are range edges in the ocean tracking temperature at all, period. For this, we zoomed out to the entire country or three regions across the country. And we used a spatial temporal model to convert the survey observations into a continuous surface that estimates biomass, which is shown here on the right. This model is called VAST. I'm happy to talk about it more if anyone's interested, but it allowed us to compare among the different surveys, which use different methods, in the same units, which is biomass over time and space. These are the three regions. You'll recognize the Northeast. We also use the US West Coast and the Eastern Bering Sea. We chose these partly because um, they have very different warming histories. And so it allowed us to really explore this question of how much edges are tracking temperature. The Northeast has warmed fairly consistently each of these lines. So the middle one is what we looked at in the previous study, which is mean annual sea surface temperature. Here, we also really focused on temperature extremes. So winter and summer temperatures shown here in blue and red. And in the Northeast, each of those lines has trended significantly and pretty consistently upwards over the 50 years for which we have data. West coast of the US does not look like this. It has not warmed. And it has these enormous temperature swings that are related to El Nino. 
The Eastern Bering Sea is sort of a mix of both. It has warmed, but not linearly. It's warmed through these dramatic temperature spikes that are related to years with no sea ice in that part of the Arctic. So across all these regions, we had this time over 150 range edges. And now we quantify these edges as quantiles of biomass, as I showed you from the spatial temporal model. But again, looking at um, the temperature at the range edge, how consistent that was over time, and how much the edge shifted over time. So when we looked at their temperature track, and we actually found that most range edges stayed within either the same summer or winter temperature or both. And for them to be tracking temperature, they don't have to track both of these dimensions because it's not likely that a range edge would be simultaneously limited by summer and winter temperature. It's probably one or the other. But so this, this first point might make you think, okay, great, range edges in the oceans are really well explained by temperature. However, the place where temperature explained them worst was the place that's had the most warming, which is the Northeast, which suggests that maybe it's not the case that these edges are tracking temperature perfectly so much as we can't reject that null hypothesis until there's conclusive evidence during a warming period that they aren't. And we also found when we zoomed out in this way that poleward edges didn't shift further than equatorward edges. So to summarize what we found on range edges, they're extremely stochastic in the oceans and the methods that you use as well as the data you have in hand really matter. I think the jury is still out on whether poleward and equatorward edges in the oceans have systematically different patterns. And while their dynamics recently are still broadly consistent with temperature, I think they're very unlikely to track temperature closely in the future as warming accelerates and we start to see a greater differentiation between where these isotherms are shifting and where the edges actually go. So in that work, we try to tie range dynamics to temperature extremes. I've also worked a little bit on range edges and dispersal. We're doing a project on biogeographic boundaries to understand, uh, to use eDNA surveys on both sides as well as traditional surveys to test what maintains range, ed range edges at the boundary. Is it um, selection after larvae cross the boundary or is it um, dispersal and currents that prevent larvae from crossing the boundary? And I'm also doing some work on dissolved oxygen to test how much that explains range edge dynamics. But we're not gonna talk about edges anymore because I want to move on to talking about prediction. And the work I've done to advance prediction is really focused on population dynamics. So we're now switching to short-term forecasting of mid-Atlantic species in order to predict species in the move. And that's really why we do this work to understand their dynamics, to get a sense of the processes that are important. It, one ma major reason is to be able to fit better models to the past and make better forecasts of the future. The way we usually predict species ranges is through correlative ecological niche models or species distribution models. And I've alluded to these a couple of times in the talk already. Many of you definitely know how they work. You take the historical observations of a species here, that's this front layer and the schematic, as well as some environmental, they could also be biological, but either one, covariates that are spatially varying that you think are important. In this example, you have southness, roughness, and rainfall. And then you use those to map a niche space of all of the combinations of these variables where the species has been found. That gives you sort of the envelope of conditions where historically we know it has persisted. And if you project that either into the past or into the future, it gives you an estimate of the species range. This approach makes a lot of mechanisms about how the species was found in that place they're, they're all implicit in these models. So you start out with usually survey data with occurrence and abundance, and you end up with some future estimate of where the species might be found and maybe also its abundance. But there's no explicit modeling of the demographic processes, the changes in fitness, the dispersal, the growth, and actually led populations of the species to change their distributions. Because all these demographic mechanisms are implicit in ecological niche models, there are scenarios in which they might not perform well. And those include short time scales where non-equilibrium or transient dynamics really matter, populations with big fluctuations in abundance, and no analog climates where there isn't a historical correlate of a temperature in a species that we can use to project the future. 
Unfortunately, this is also a laundry list of our future. This is where most global ecosystems are heading and the type of conditions into which we would most like to be able to forecast. The path forward that's been proposed is using process-based models that explicitly model these mechanisms connecting species to their environment. And the model I'm gonna talk about addresses four of these six proposed in this paper. We'll talk about dispersal, demography, physiology, and environment. It does not yet have species interactions or evolution. And if th there's a reason that these models haven't been widely adopted yet, process-based models are really data hungry compared to an ecological niche model. They require good estimates of parameters that can be very hard to estimate. These same parameters about growth and dispersal that we don't know for most species. And you need to model these processes at appropriate scales, which is really a big challenge in going from a population model to a spatial population model. Understanding at what scales different drivers should vary is really non-trivial. But the approach that we're taking is to unpack this black box into a more explicit model. We start with our survey data. Again, this doesn't require additional data compared to other approaches, although it's nice if we have a lot of it. And you fit a model, population model, about growth, dispersal, et cetera, to that data to estimate key parameters. Once you have those parameters in hand, you can simulate the future and again, end up with a forecast of occurrence and abundance. If this works, it would be great because we could capture transient population dynamics. It's a framework that's very flexible and could be used to incorporate important ecological processes and answer management questions. We could project into no analog climates using these functional relationships between process rates and temperature. And hopefully it would be more accurate at short time scales, which is the time scale at which we're much more useful to managers. I think as ecologists, again, uh, we rarely get asked where species will be in 2050 or 2100, but it would be very helpful to be able to say where it will be next year. So my postdoc project is making one to 10 year forecasts of species range dynamics, meaning I'll be alive and well to see how wrong I was. And comparing them to these traditional species distribution models. This sounds like a theoretical ecology project and it is, but it's also a partnership with managers. We're working with the Mid-Atlantic Fisheries Management Council to fit models to four focal species that we've identified as representing a range of life histories and management challenges. So the model implementation starts out with this fitting process where we have our survey data and estimate parameters. These figures are all from a paper that's mostly finished developing this model and simulated data. So probably won't look as well fitted once I fit it to real data. But we start out by fitting this model to spatially structured data on historical occurrences and abundances. From that, we estimate parameters and then we make a simulation of the future that will hopefully follow the real data as well as this figure does. And of course, this model is spatial. So we do this for multiple patches along the coastline and also multiple life stages, stage structured model. And some of these process rates that we're estimating are temperature dependent, which is how we can simulate the effects of climate change. So my next steps are to, everything we just talked about is sort of the process model element of this work. I also need to fit observation models to the real data, which are very um, non-normally distributed and messy. So that's a challenge. Once that's done, we'll forecast the most recent decade of years, which we've been holding out as our testing data, compete that against other models, and then in the future, incorporate the effects of fishing and maybe some other processes to improve the fit of these models, which will hopefully be used for fisheries management purposes. Those purposes are where I wanna end, how we can use this information to manage marine species in the move. You might not feel very encouraged about managing marine species in the move after this talk, uh, because I've been stressing how challenging they are to manage or to predict and how unique and stochastic species range dynamics have been. So we thought this, we also thought about that challenge in the context of marine protected areas, which are very small. Marine species ranges are very big and the scale of range shifts are also very big. So we wanted to provide a concrete set of recommendations. If you're going to put a small marine protected area in the water in the face of climate change, what's the best way to adapt it to species on the move? 
And we came up with some recommendations to get the biggest biogeographical bang for your buck, so to speak. One of those is to protect migration corridors like the ones I just showed you on land. We might not know exactly where marine species will shift, but we can get some idea based on available habitat and climate velocities where species might be likely to pass through. We should also protect biogeographic boundaries. These are places where historically many species have had range edges. That's what defines the different biota on each side. And so a range edge might be a dispersal barrier and it might be a place where a species has trouble shifting past. Poleward edges of species if protected are likely to retain those species for longer than the equatorward part of the range as the species shifts through. Thermal refugia is a concept that we borrowed from the terrestrial biogeography literature, like some of these other suggestions. And they're not as common in the oceans, but they do exist. There are parts of the oceans that are locally cooler than what's around them, and they're likely to aggregate biodiversity. And finally, also more commonly on land, but still in the oceans, we can have populations that are very genetically distinct from the rest of the species or have high genetic diversity. And in both of those cases, they might contribute valuable uh, genetic variation for adapting to climate change. That project, that work is done, but I'm still trying to contribute toward how we manage species in the move. Uh, we're wrapping up a project now looking at how resilient one popular management strategy for coastal small scale fisheries is, the territorial use rights for fisheries management scheme, how resilient that is to disturbances like species on the move. And once this dynamic range model that I'm developing in my postdoc research is a little further along, we'll also be using it for management strategy evaluation to look at how different future fishing scenarios, the spatial footprint of fishing and its intensity affects species ability to track climate change. So I wanna end with this question that I started with and hopefully I've convinced you that there are many empirical analyses that we can do now to understand species on the move better that we can also predict past and future dynamics with process-based models, and that we don't need to wait around for perfect information to start managing for species on the move. Thank you.